I'm, I'm, I'm challenged this morning. So, hey, if you're joining us online, we want to say welcome. Would you just welcome the people that are joining us online? Yes. We're glad to have all of you joining us today and for all of you that are here in person. We are wrapping up a, a sermon series that we've been in the last two weeks called Can I Get a Witness? And uh, I am your messenger today to wrap up this this final message in this series, uh, Can I Get a Witness? A witness we've learned is someone who tells what they have seen, what they have heard, what they've experienced. Pastor Zach mentioned last week that you don't have to go to uh, car school to, if you, if you were a witness to a car accident, you don't have to go to school to learn all about cars to tell what you saw in that accident. So it's a witness is simply telling what we've seen, what we've heard, what we've experienced. Acts chapter 4, verse 20, the verse that I want to jump off from today is Peter and John uh, in the book of Acts, they had been, um, they had actually performed a miracle and healed a guy that was at the gate beautiful. He had been lame uh, from birth and, uh, and Peter said, I don't, I don't have silver or gold, but what I have I'll give you and just reached out a hand and said in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And that man stood up. And it says that he began walking and leaping and praising God. And, and uh, they, they were called into the religious council and said, look, um, it's undeniable what happened here, but we're commanding you never again to speak in the name of Jesus. You need to stop this, and I don't want, we don't want to happen anymore. And their response was obviously natural. They said, um, we can't stop telling about everything that we've seen and heard. We cannot and we will not. We'll just keep speaking. And they went back to uh, their friends and family and they prayed a prayer saying, Lord, just give us more boldness that we might speak freely and speak uh, greatly about all that you have done. So Peter and John, their uh, allegiance was to God. They were committed to the mission of taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and telling people everywhere the message of Jesus. They had seen things. They had heard things that were impossible for them not to tell. You see, the gospel is more than just good news. The gospel is great news, news that needs to be shared. And as a, a Christian, as a true follower of Jesus, your life is changed. Same response I got in the first service. As a believer, as a true follower of Jesus, your life has forever been changed. Amen? And it's... You've been, you've been saved, you've been set free, you have been redeemed and bought with the blood of the Lamb of, of God, Jesus Christ, your sons and daughters of the Most High God, the creator of the universe. The Bible says that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. The Bible tells us that the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us. We have been given the greatest gift, and Jesus has given us the Holy Spirit so that we can have power to be witnesses. Acts 1-8 has been our verse that we've been using throughout this series where uh, the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses. Psalm 107, verse 1 and 2 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. How many of you remember singing that song a few years ago? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I got, you, I got you on the wrong key. I did better. I changed keys three times in the last service. So, <laughs> We've been redeemed. We've been set free. Listen, the NIV says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. The, NI, the NLT says it like this. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Listen, we have been redeemed. We have been set free. We've been changed because of Jesus Christ and all that he's done for us. And we need to speak. We need to tell somebody. We need to say so. So let's do that. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you're the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're to go public with the message of who he is. We are called to be his witnesses. We have talked about in the last couple of weeks, 
God's story. Pastor August shared about how we are to tell his story, to take the light of Jesus to the dark places of the world, to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, telling people everywhere about him. Last week, Pastor Zach talked about my story. We all have a story, an active, ongoing narrative of what God is doing in my life, both big and small things. My story, your story is and should be a reflection of God's story. We need to tell our story. And today I am going to share a message that I've entitled Their Story. You see, there are things that God is doing all around us. It may not be something that uh, has happened to me personally, but it's something that I've witnessed, something that I have seen or heard or experienced. John chapter 12 we read about uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem just a few days before his crucifixion. And a large crowd had gathered along the road, and it says that they were waving palm branches and they were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in verse 17 and 18, it mentions that it says the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. You see, just not long before this uh, is when Jesus raised Lazarus. Pastor Austin mentioned that just a, a few minutes ago. He raised Lazarus, and there was a lot of people that were there, and it tells us that the people that were there continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So people were coming from all over everywhere because the people that had experienced Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead continued to speak, continued to tell the story, continued to witness what Jesus had done. And the word got out and people were coming to Jesus. There's a lot of examples of witnesses in the Bible. The apostle John was a witness. John wrote the gospel of John. He wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And in 1st John chapter 1, the first three verses, John writes this. He says, we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, whom we have heard and seen. They're witnesses. We saw him with our own eyes and touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. The one who is life itself was revealed to us, and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father, and then he was revealed to us. And we proclaim to you what we ourselves have actually seen and heard. John's saying, look, I was there. I saw him, I was with him, I heard him, I saw what he did, I heard what happened. I'm an eyewitness, it happened on my watch. Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 22, uh, Saul, his name was Saul before and he was a persecutor of the Christians and we read in in, uh, Acts that he was on his way with papers to Damascus when God interrupted him and uh, and blinded him with with a great light. And Jesus spoke to him and called him uh, to follow him and to be his messenger. Completely did a 180. Well, Saul was blind and his his followers with him took him to Damascus. And he picks up the story as he's telling this story. You see, Paul had been brought in by people who said, look, we don't want to hear your message anymore. And and in Acts 21, we see that they brought him in and they were going to kill him. They were beating him like crazy until someone stepped in and intervened. And then he addresses the crowd. And he says this, a man named Ananias came to see me. This is when he was in Damascus and he'd been blind. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see. And then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. And you will be his his witness to all the people of what you have seen and heard. Paul was a witness. The Bible tells us that Jesus was a witness. John the Baptist, John chapter 3, verse 32, said that he, Jesus, testifies what he has seen and heard. John the Baptist had sent some disciples to Jesus and uh, to ask him this question, and they asked him the question, and they said, are you the Messiah that is to come, or should we be looking for somebody else? And this was Jesus' response to John's disciples. He said, you go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. 
You go back and report to John what you've seen and heard, and this is it. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. There's a great testimony of God's power in John chapter 9 where where Jesus uh, heals a man who has been blind from birth. John chapter 9, the first three verses, it says as they were walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth, and, and the disciples asked him, they said, Rabbi, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or because of his parents' sins? And Jesus said, it's not because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so that the power of God could be seen in him. He's saying, look, we all, want, we all want to know the reason why things happen the way they do. This man is blind, not because he sinned, not because his parents sinned. This man has been blind from birth for this very moment right now because we would be walking by him and you are going to ask me this question and I'm going to say, the reason this man is blind is for this moment right here so that the power of God can be displayed in his life. And the Bible says that Jesus spit in the dirt, formed mud, put mud on his eyes, and he said, go wash in the pool. And as he was obedient to do so, when he washed in the pool, he instantly received his sight, never had seen in his life. We often ask why things happen the way they do. You see, we live in a world that is, seems very unfair. It seems like all the time we're complaining, not fair. Why me? Why did this happen to me? What did I do wrong to deserve this? Have you heard that before? I know you've never said that. Maybe you've thought that before. But listen, we live in a world where good behavior isn't always rewarded. We live in a world where bad behavior isn't always punished. We live in a world where innocent people sometimes suffer. But I want you to think about this. This is just a little bit of a theology on suffering and problems. If God took away our pain and our suffering every time we asked him, would we be following him only for comfort and convenience? If God took away our pain and suffering every time we ask him, we would only be following him out of comfort and convenience and not out of love and devotion. So when you're going through a time of suffering, you're going through a time of trouble, whether it's a disease or something tragic has happened in your life or there's a disability that you've lived with, try not to ask this question, why did this happen to me? What did I do wrong? Ask God for strength through the trial for a clearer perspective on what's happening. And realize this, that every pain, every problem, every trial, every trouble is an opportunity in disguise. Every problem, every pain, every trouble, every trial is simply an opportunity in disguise. And you're saying, Pastor Jeff, you don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what I've lived with. And I, it's true. None of us know what each other is dealing with. But the reality is just like this blind man who had been blind his whole life. It was an opportunity for God to show his power. And God healed him in a moment. James chapter 1 says, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy when you face trials. How many of you are, are, have figured out the joy in trials? With the record show, I don't see many hands. The New Living Translation says it like this. When trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When trouble comes your way, consider it, consider it an opportunity for great joy. So when we see trouble, we should be like, yes! <laughs> this is an opportunity. We laugh about that, but it's the reality. That's what James says. Consider it joy consider it an opportunity of great joy for you know that when your faith is tested your endurance has a chance to grow so let it grow let it grow it can only grow through the trials how do you view your problems do your problems overwhelm you do you see them as a burden or can you see them as an opportunity for you to grow to make you better to gain something that you would never be able to gain otherwise than going through the valley that you're going through right now. It's an opportunity for God to work in your life and display his power. You see, spiritual growth and maturity only comes and will only happen through testing. It only comes through the testing. 
your faith will only become stronger and made pure through trials. So let it grow. Consider it an opportunity for great joy when you face troubles and trials. In every one of the stories I'm getting ready to tell you about, there wouldn't be a story of God's goodness without tragedy or trouble. I'm gonna share a few stories with you this morning. And they're stories that are great stories, but the goodness of God would only, is only seen through the tragedy or through the trouble, through the pain or the problems. It's been said, that, and it's true, that there's no triumph without tragedy. I'm gonna ask Pastor Luke to come up. He led a team to El Salvador, and they just got back on, on Thursday. Let me tell you this. We need to tell the stories of what God has done and what God is doing all around us. We need to tell those stories, whether it's a firsthand personal eyewitness experience that you've had or something that you have seen or heard in someone else's life. So listen to Pastor Luke and give an update and report of what's gone on in El Salvador. We had the opportunity, honor, and privilege to take a team of 20, mostly high school students, uh, to El Salvador. We just got back on Thursday. And let me just give you some backstory quick quickly through COVID uh, has absolutely destroyed the country of El Salvador. People are absolutely desperate um, and hungry and starving. And uh, God has opened a mighty door through that suffering for his spirit to move in people's lives to break down some walls. And so last year, you as a church and your missions dollars were able to build a building for their kids ministry at the main church in El Salvador, it's air conditioned. It's got like seven classrooms. You can see some pictures of, of, of it on the screen. But the testimony there is as I'm hearing the ministry leaders um, weeping, telling us they're showing us their appreciation and thanks for this building. Uh, Pastor Don, the lead missionary who started King's Castle, um, he said that this building has been a beacon of hope and has been a rudder that has got that ministry through COVID. Because the people stood on the promise that said God would not provide a miracle building like this if he, if he didn't have a plan to use it and fill it for his name, right? And so I just sat there and wept as we walked through these classrooms for the, the amount of students and kids that would get to hear and experience Jesus in a whole new way because of your sacrifice. We also, uh, let me give you some numbers about the ministry that was able to happen through our students. We were able to reach 1,990 people through our programs. We had 233 people come and receive Jesus for the first time. Amen. Amen. We give opportunity for them to come uh, if they have needs or specific prayer requests that we get to pray for. And so we were able to pray with 350 of them for problems that they're going through in their life. We were able to pray for 420 of them for specifically healings that they needed, whether themselves or in their family or someone that they know. And I'm believing that we, well, I know that we saw some of that. We literally saw healing in front of our eyes, numerous stories, but I'm believing that God is, as they went back home and back to their families and communities, that God was going to heal and, and solve and work in mighty ways. Our students also got just severely impacted by stepping out in faith. Um, we had even two of our students receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues for the first time. We had a call, a full-time call into missions. We had a reaffirmed call to full-time ministry. We had students stepping out in ways of faith and sacrifice and obedience I've never seen before and God working mightily through them. And so I am thankful that I was able to be a part on your behalf and from this church to see and hear the things that God was doing and sharing that testimony to you today. Amen. We give thanks. You know, when, when Don Triplett was here, it was in January before COVID happened, and I don't think, Pastor Weaver, that we had a plan to do anything, but you had asked him if he had any projects, and I think that was a big project that he was reluctant to tell us about, but we took that project on, and I can't remember $100,000 that was given toward that, and then COVID happened in March. We were taking a team in June last year. We were 
we had about 70 or 80 people going to El Salvador last summer that didn't happen. But thankfully, God had or, organized and orchestrated all that plenty ahead of time. So thank you for, for giving to that. I want to share some stories just of things that have happened recently that I think it's, it's, it's an opportunity for, for us to, to give thanks, to celebrate. God is doing uh, great things with us. Um, I, I have a new friend named Stephen Sanders. Stephen's mom, I don't know if any of you know Barb Shaquin, but Barb uh, passed away May 3rd from cancer. Barb and her husband Bob had come to New Hope a little over two years ago. Uh, Bob worked with Danita Kraft at Mercy, and um, her son Stephen lived here in town, and Stephen and his family came to church once or twice. I know that I met him over the, over the period of the two years, but he didn't want to have anything to do with coming to church. He had had some past hurts in his life and uh, didn't, didn't, didn't care to meet me. She said, oh, you got to meet Pastor Jeff, and you got to come to our church, and he didn't want to have any of that. But Barb passed away, and Stephen said to me, you know, my mom passed away, and I felt so lost and so lonely, and so empty. Bob came to my office and we were gonna plan Barb's funeral and Stephen came along. And this is the first time I met Stephen other than the one time I met him in the, in the lobby. Stephen came along. And really for the next two hours, we didn't do any funeral planning. We just had a time of just talking and um, really it was just, just talking with each other. And so I got to know Stephen a little bit. Uh, we talked through just some difficult things. They were struggling. And uh, I called Bob the next day and I said, Bob, hey, we really didn't get any funeral planning. I don't know if you have time tomorrow to come back to my office. And he said, sure, I'll come after work. Well, uh, we were supposed to meet at two o'clock and 10 minutes before that meeting, uh, Stephen, his stepson shows up and uh, Stephen said, Pastor Jeff, I just have some questions. He said, I really feel like God is calling me back to a relationship with him. But he said, I'm, I'm, so, I'm, I'm so emotional, I don't want to make an emotional decision. And we just talked through that a little bit and didn't, didn't make any decision right there or anything like that. I said, Stephen, God uses all kinds of circumstances. I know that your mom wanted more than anything for you to come back to a relationship with Jesus. I know that Jesus wants a relationship with you. And I said, if you feel like it's just too emotional or whatever, God, God understands that and, and he'll work with that. Well, later he told me, and it was at the funeral when he was sharing at his mom's funeral, he said, yesterday I went and met with Pastor, Pastor Jeff and he said, I had to leave that meeting early and I had to go pick up my daughter at school, sitting in his car, listening to a Casting Crown song on the radio. He accepted Jesus, invited Jesus to come back into his life. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He said, I feel like a different person. I wish I, could have, I, wished I would have come back to God sooner. He said, it took something tragic and dramatic to change my circumstances. I lost my mom but I regained Jesus. Stephen's gonna be here in the 11 o'clock service with his family this morning, and I'm so, so excited. Some of you know Barb Stiles. Her last name is Weiss now. She got married to Charlie after um, her, her former husband, Mike, passed away. And Barb has a son, Bobby. And uh, Bobby had, had been, been clean, had struggled off and on with drugs, and had been clean, but had a situation where he I think accidentally OD'd and someone found him where he was staying and they rushed him to the hospital. They ended up moving him from Waverly to, to Waterloo and um, they asked him, you know, how much do you want to battle this? You, you, are you serious about doing this? Like, this is going to be a tough road ahead of you. And he said, yes, I want to fight. They ended up putting him in, in an induced coma and uh, in that induced coma, just to let his body rest and heal a little bit. And somewhere in that process, um, his... Um, his, his body started shutting down. So this is, this is Nancy's nephew. And uh, so they said, it's not, it's not gonna be good. They decided that they were gonna have to take him off life support. And the word was that he would only last maybe a minute or two. Well, I was looking back through my text messages and I got a message from Pastor Courtney because Barb had been talking with Pastor Courtney and it was Tuesday, May 4th. This, um, Courtney messaged me saying, Grandma Barb is wondering about Saturday for the funeral service. And I said, this Saturday? She said, yes. And my question to her was, has he passed away? 
And she said, I think he's still on the vent. I'll find out. And I said, I'm just wondering, sometimes they remove life support and the heart and lungs keep working. And she messaged me back and said, Barb said, no, we're taking him off the vent at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. Doctor said that would be it, that he wouldn't make it more than a minute or two. Well, they took him off life support, and he breathed, and his heart was beating on his own. Even to the point where he asked for a cheeseburger. Barb's Facebook post on Wednesday, March 5th said, God gave me a miracle today. Yesterday we were planning his funeral and he had his last rites. Today he's opened his eyes and looked at me and I said, God's not done with you, Bobby. She said, the very first conversation I had with Bobby is, Bobby, I just need to know, am I gonna see you in heaven someday? And he said, Mom, I'm not, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, I've done so many bad things and I've hurt so many people and I don't know the way back to Jesus. And she said, Bobby, I can show you the way. And she told him, Bobby, we're just, you, you come to Jesus. He'll forgive you of your sins. You repent, and he'll come. And she led him in a prayer to accept Christ, and he came into his life. Listen, this was just like hours after they took him off, the, off of the ventilator, and he wasn't supposed to live. Four days, he did pretty good. He had that cheeseburger in that time, and then his body began to fail. And three days after that, he passed away, seven days after they took him off life support. God saved his life, did a miracle, so that today Bobby could be in heaven. And at the, the message... The message of hope and salvation was given to that group of some pretty, pretty rough and tough... Um, I'm going to say it, Nancy. There were some rough characters there. But they heard the message that Bobby, because of his faith, because of his faith in Jesus, is in heaven today. If they want to see Bobby, they've got to follow the same way. I don't know how many of you know Ralph Vance, but this week, Ralph Vance passed away. But God raised him from the dead. This was just three days ago on Thursday. I got a text from Joyce, his wife, at 2.21 in the afternoon. And she said, please pray. And there was about seven exclamation marks. It was to Pastor Weaver and myself. And I said, pray. And then I picked up the phone and called her. And I said, Joyce, what's going on? And I could tell she was really shaken. She said, I can't talk right now. And she handed the phone to her son, Aaron. And Aaron said, Pastor Jeff, it doesn't look good. He's, they're, they're, the paramedics are here. They're trying to, they're trying to get a, a, a heartbeat. They're trying to get um, air in his lungs, but he's not breathing and his heart's not beating. They're working on him. I talked to Ed, Ed um, Leadham, who is one of their neighbors, and he happened to be there when all, all the commotion was going on. And he said, Pastor Jeff, they, the paramedics worked on him for several minutes. They even stopped to see, and he wasn't breathing, and it didn't, they couldn't find a pulse. So they restarted everything, gave him a few shots of epinephrine, I think is what it is. And uh, somewhere at that point, till they got him in the, because I heard they wouldn't take him to the hospital if, there, if they didn't have some kind of a pulse. And Aaron called me and said, we're heading to the hospital. But see, we fully expected, I fully expected going to the hospital to meet them there, that I was going to comfort a family grieving a loss. And that's really when they put us in a room and we hadn't seen Ralph yet, um, fully expecting that's, that's what we were gonna find. And so I, I just said to them, I said, guys, I don't, I don't have words to say. I don't, I don't know what to say here. Ralph has been through a lot of stuff in the last couple of months. He had surgery in March, and it's just been struggle after struggle. And, um, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer that until I hear that he is completely dead and gone, we just pray for a miracle. And so we prayed, and I, it wasn't like I was saying I'm, I'm, I'm not acknowledging the circumstances here. I'm not just putting my head in the sand and ignoring the reality. I felt the reality of that more as much. I mean, they were feeling it more than I was. But we prayed, and my prayer was simply this. God, I, I know that you can raise people from the dead. You can do anything. You're God. And if there is an, ever an opportunity, Ralph uh, is a man who would give a witness, give a testimony of the fact that you raised him from the dead, and nobody could tell a story like Ralph about coming back from the dead. And so we just pray that you would, that you would work a miracle here and heal him. And we prayed that, and I gotta say, it wasn't like we were optimistic, but just a few minutes later, the doctor came in and sat down and said, well, he's sitting up in the bed, his eyes are open, 
and he's breathing on his own. And we're just shocked. But praise God for what, what he has done. Ralph still has a long ways to go. You saw a picture of, one picture with him smiling was in the ER just a couple of hours after he went in. After he went in and was laying on the floor in their home, not breathing, no heartbeat, no pulse. And, um, but God has done, done a work there. I, I ask that you pray for Ralph. He has a long, long ways to go. He had gone to the doctor uh, Thursday afternoon, and they were just getting home from the doctor when he collapsed in their, in their kitchen. He weighs 111.6 pounds. He's lost 70 pounds in the last couple of years. God needs, we need a miracle from God. I just want to ask if you would just take a moment right now. Let's pray for Ralph. Father, in Jesus' name, we agree together as a church, as a family, as a body, for Ralph and for his healing. God, I pray that you would intervene and do something miraculous in his life. Thank you, God, for giving him life. Thank you, God. We don't understand how you work, why you work, what you do, when you do it. But God, we're just giving you thanks today because we know it's an absolute miracle that he's still here with us. And I believe, God, that you have something great in store. God, that this will be a testimony that every one of us can share of what you have done. Lord, we want to be your witnesses to take this message of hope and healing, of health and salvation to a world around us that is lost. So help us, Lord, we pray. Minister healing and health to this family, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite the worship team to come and just challenge you with this. Every one of us has a story to tell. It may not be a miracle story like that. But whatever God has done in your life, you're a witness. What you see and hear God doing all around you, you're a witness. We just need to pay attention to the things that are going on around us so that we can see and hear God in it. So we got to look through the right lenses to really see what's going on, and that lens is a lens of faith. And here's, here's the reality. We have plenty to say. We have a lot to talk about. And I want to encourage you to speak up and to use your voice. Here's how I want us to end our time. I want to invite you to stand with me this morning. And I want to ask, I want to ask for a couple of responses here. I want to ask how many of you today would say, Pastor Jeff, I need the boldness. I need boldness in my life to be a witness. The kind of, the kind of boldness that says, you know what, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to stop talking about everything that God, I've seen him do what I've seen and heard. And I wanna be bold in what, I, in what I do for Jesus. You say, I need his power, I need the Holy Spirit power, and I need boldness. I'm gonna invite, I'm, I believe we're on the verge of God doing something absolutely incredible and miraculous. And listen, what Jesus has done is too good for us not to share. What he's done in your life, what he's done in the lives of people around, you can tell other people's stories too. God is a faithful God. He's been good. He's faithful. He has been faithful and he'll continue to be faithful. But we've got to speak. I want to encourage those that are asking for boldness in just a moment, I ask you to come and, and stand in this part of the altar over here. And I want to know how many of you today, you need, you need a, a miracle. You need healing. You need something um, in your life for God to do. I mean, God raised Ralph from the dead. He can heal cancers. He can do all kinds of miraculous things. He can heal your family, your relationships. How many of you say you need God to do something miraculous in your life? You need healing in your life. I want to ask if those people would come right here, and we're going to pray for those people. So we're going to have people that are asking for boldness, people that need God to do something. And you might be in both camps. You decide where you want to go. But what I'm asking, there's nothing special about coming to this altar except it's a step of faith saying, God, I want all that you have for me. And God, I'm giving you all of me so you can have all of me. For we know that you're good and you do good things. We know that your presence is with us always. God, that your power has been made available through, to us through your Holy Spirit. And we need your power. God, for everyone who's come saying, I need boldness. God, would you just endue them with power fresh and new today? God, would you just give them purpose to be able to see the way that you want them to see with eyes of faith, to see their circumstances and their situations through faith. That God, these are opportunities for you to display your power. These are opportunities for us to tell of your goodness. These are opportunities where we can see your hand at work. God, and for every person that has come for prayer this morning, God, we're believing you for answers to those prayers. 
not to answer them how we would want, but God, you have supernatural power and ability, and you see things that we don't see, and you know things, God, that we don't know. We trust you and lean on you. God, we need you. We need you. I pray for Linda, God, who has lost her mom, Evelyn, this week. I just pray that your peace and your presence would minister, God, bring comfort to her, for her brothers and her family. God, we, we need you. We thank you, God, that you never leave us. You're always with us. God, I pray for anyone in the room today who is not walking in a relationship with you, who doesn't know the freedom and the joy and the peace of, of, of walking in relationship, being forgiven of their sins today, that they would speak out and just say, Jesus, save me, forgive me, heal me, make my heart new. Give me a new outlook on life and a new relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for your salvation, the free gift. And we accept it and receive it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.